Uh, my name's Peter, um, and I'm one of the pastors um, in one of the churches that are involved in this network. And it's really, really great um, to say hello to you tonight and to welcome you. So um, I did this earlier, and there were some pictures. I'm kind of grateful there aren't pictures now, um, because I'm going to share with you um, an embarrassment um, of mine in the past. So I'm glad that you don't get to see me dressed in horrible stuff, but I'll, I'll talk more about that later. I asked my kids, I've got four children, and I asked them... Um, a question. I asked them, would they rather fail an exam in front of all of their friends, or would it be worse um, if they turned up at school and they were in fancy dress and nobody else was? Um, and so they thought about that, and I think, I think they felt they were both pretty terrible options, but the worst one was being dressed different to everybody else. Is that fair, Abby? I don't know if that's what you guys would reckon as well. Being dressed something funny when everybody else is different is not nice. Um, I think n close to that came me turning up to pick them up in fancy dress, and they didn't like the idea of that at all. Now, I personally, I failed exams before, and I felt a bit ashamed um, that I failed them. But what was far worse than that by a mile um, was the shame I felt that my uncle and auntie's I think it was in 1989. I was only seven or eight years old. Um, but they asked me to be a page boy, um, and I had to wear a sailor suit. I had to wear one of these, oh, it's disgusting, navy top, little white sh or shorts down to there. And I didn't care. I wasn't the kid that really cared what people thought of me. But that was just too far. That was too much. I, I remember just feeling ashamed that all these people were seeing me dressed like this, holding the hand of my little brother as we walked down the aisle. But it, it still makes me cringe to think about it. It still makes me embarrassed um, to think about it even now. I spoke to my mum about this to get the photo, um, and she said, I don't know why I made you do it if you felt that bad about it, but I really did um, feel ashamed. Now, the question we're looking at tonight, why did Jesus live? There's many different answers to that question, many different good answers to that question. Um, but the ones we're going to focus on in the next few minutes are these. Um, Jesus lived to pass an exam for you that you could never pass by yourself. Um, we're, I'm going to call that God's goodness exam, but Jesus lived to pass that exam for you um, and for me. Jesus lived um, to give me clothes to wear that mean I won't be ashamed to be in God's presence and um, clothes that I couldn't um, have made by myself. And Jesus lived to accept the shame that I deserved and you deserved for failing um, and for the filthy state of our lives. So Jesus um, lived to pass an exam for you. Jesus lived to give you some good clothes to wear in God's presence. Um, and Jesus lived to, give, to take that shame that we deserve. Now, the shame that I felt for failing my corporate law exam in second or third year of university, now, that would be nothing compared to the shame I would feel if the God of perfection and love said to me, you have failed the exam of life. Or the shame I felt being dressed in that just disgraceful navy and white sailor suit in front of my cousins and my other brothers and my sister, the shame I felt then, well, that'd be nothing compared to the shame I would feel if I realized I was standing in front of the, the completely perfect God and he could see the state of my life, stained with sin and hatred and, and selfishness, corrupting everything. The shame I would feel then would be far, far worse. I'm going to read to you a part of the Bible that is one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' death on the cross. Now, it might seem a strange place to go to Jesus' death to try to answer why he lived. But actually, there's no clearer part of his life that shows us two things that we must understand tonight if we are to have hope for this life, but more importantly, hope for the eternal life that we are all going to experience when we die. The cross, you see, it shows us just how bad we really are. It shows us that we are failing God's goodness exam. It shows us that we're completely unprepared to take our sinful lives into the presence of God. But wonderfully, the cross also shows us just how good Jesus is. Not just a kind of outward, shallow surface goodness, but a complete goodness, a through and through goodness, a whole goodness. Every little bit about Jesus is good. You see, as with every single person, we see what they're really made of when the pressure is on. So I was telling um, the guys back there about the breakfast we had in this room this morning. It was delicious. Um, uh, a guy called Gabriel made it. It's a rainy and eggs 
flatbread and a raw onion. <laughs> but yeah, exactly, a raw onion. Um, and I ate the raw onion anyway, stubbornly ate most of it. Um, and I really enjoyed the breakfast, it was delicious, but um, the rest of the morning, I, just onion everywhere, it was terrible. I needed to clean my teeth. Um, I really needed to clean my teeth. I ate loads of soft mints, that kind of did it, but I needed to clean my teeth. But when you get a tube of toothpaste, um, you don't know what's inside it. Um, you don't know if it's the stripy one or the, the, the white one or whatever. You don't know what until you squeeze it. Um, and then what comes out shows itself. And when you squeeze and squeeze a person, when you put them under pressure, you begin to see what they're really made of. You begin to see what's on the inside when the pressure comes on. Now, up to this point on the cross, where we're going to read about in a moment, Jesus' life has been amazing. Okay? Jesus' life has been perfection. Not a perfection that pushes people away. You know, that type of holier-than-thou perfection that nobody likes. It's not that at all. It was a perfection that drew people to him. People surrounded him. People wanted to be with him and to hear him and, and to be close to him. It was an attractive, loving perfection. If you examined every part of Jesus' life, you wouldn't find one little bit of bad. It was pure goodness all the way through. Um, absolutely spotless. There was nothing in Jesus' life for him to be ashamed of. Now, I'm sure you're sitting here tonight and you can think of some things you can be properly ashamed of. Nothing in Jesus' life to be ashamed of. And it wasn't an easy life. It was a life of tiredness. It was a life of hard people. Um, it was a life of difficult family um, situations. It was a life of constant opposition. It was a difficult life. But also, it was a life of popularity. It was a life of praise it was a life of attention. Either one of those things would turn our heads. <laughs> Either one of those things would turn us wrong. But Jesus only did what was good, what is right, all of the time. Um, he completely and utterly practiced what he preached. He did love the Lord as God with all his heart, his soul, his strength, his mind. Um, he did love his neighbor as himself, even when it hurt him to do so. But with nails hammered through his hands and his legs with a body that has been battered and scarred by the worst that humans can do to it, what is going to come out of Jesus when he is squeezed like he's never been squeezed before? There's a sheet on your tables if you want to follow along. It looks like that. Um, and it's, it's part of this eyewitness account of Jesus' death. So if you want to read it while I read it, you can. If you just want to listen, feel free to just listen as well. So this is from the Gospel of Luke. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we're under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. An amazing part of the Bible. But did you notice what came out of Jesus as he was brutally squeezed on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. People have lied and have manipulated to get Jesus to this point on the cross, bleeding out. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them. The same people who lied to get him there now pour scorn upon him. They're insulting him. You know, he saved others. Let him save himself. And Jesus' response is, Father, forgive them. Soldiers have battered him and, and spat at him, and now they just casually gamble for the clothes they dragged off him. And Jesus' response is, Father, forgive them. This utterly innocent man, 
hung up to die in the middle of criminals. He's even insulted by one of these guilty, rotten men who are dying beside him. And Jesus' response is, Father, forgive them. Just think for a moment in your own life, okay? Be honest with yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. Maybe you can be honest later out loud if you want. But just think how hard it is to forgive anyone in your life, even for the smallest of offenses that they may have caused you. How good are you at forgiving? Well, start small, okay? How good are you at forgiving when uh, another Audi driver cuts in in front of you, all right? You know, I'm not very good at that, like these Audi drivers. How good are you at forgiving? You, you, you must know yourself when you're sitting in your car. I guess you guys aren't driving yet, but um, how good are you when you know that somebody's left you out at something or, or somebody said something about you um, behind your back or even to you that you don't like? How good are you at forgiving? Are you good at forgiving when somebody insults you in front of others? That's even harder um, to, 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 get, to let them away with, isn't it? Are you good at forgiving? Are you good at forgiving? Let's take it up a notch. Are you good at forgiving when somebody damages your family? That's a very hard thing um, to forgive, isn't it? Just think about the last time somebody offended you in any way. Like, Did your words or your thoughts or your actions, did they match up to Jesus' here on the cross? See, the cross shines the brightest of lights on Jesus. And what we get to see is amazing. Um, Jesus passes the test. Jesus' goodness, it's not skin deep. And then the cross shines the brightest of lights on the people around the cross and the other people on the crosses as well. And, and actually on us too. And what we see is pretty appalling. We, we fail the test. Our goodness is inadequate. So let's move our attention now then to another man in this account. And you might not think of it, you might, it might not strike you, but, but this man that we're going to think about, he's got a couple of big advantages over us sitting in this room tonight. I guess especially over you guys um, because you're young and there's no way um, I, I think you'll have given much thought to, to this first thing. The first advantage that he knows and that he accepts is that he is going to die. He has to accept it. <laughs> he's on a cross. It's coming for him. He knows he's going to die. Now, I know we know we're going to die theoretically, but really, none of us really expect it to happen. I don't think so anyway, in my experience. I've been a minister for five years. This is my sixth year now. Um, I've taken loads of funerals. I've dealt with loads of people in hospitals. And just speaking for me personally, I'm still shocked by death. I can't get my head around it. I never expect it to happen. Even the people who are ill in hospital, I never actually expect it to happen. Um, I just can't, um, I can't really accept that it's a thing. And yet, it devastates us all the time. How many really tonight, how many of you guys here actually expect to die? How many of you are prepared to die? This man knew it was coming and he knew he needed to be prepared. And a second advantage, it might not again sound like an advantage to you, but this man knows he's going to fail God's goodness exam. He knows it. He knows that if he turns up in front of God now, he's dressed completely wrongly. He knows that hell is for him instead of heaven. Now, how many of us actually know that? I, I was saying again to the guys at the back, we've been doing the doors, like knocking on some doors in, in our church's area recently. And nearly all the conversations I've had with people, and I've had loads of brilliant conversations, nearly all of them accept that there's a God, some type of God somewhere. But also nearly every single one of them think that they're kind of good enough for God. Whatever way they're living, that's more or less good enough for this God. We often call this man we're thinking about, the thief on the cross. He may well have been a murderer as well. But as he has been bleeding the same as Jesus, as he's been struggling to breathe the same as Jesus, he's been watching Jesus. And as he has watched Jesus, he has realized that Jesus is utterly different from every single other person that he's ever watched ever, and especially the people around the crosses, and especially the people on the crosses. Look at what he says to the other dying criminal at this point. We read it. This man says, look, we're punished justly. We're getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now, this isn't just a simple observation for this dying criminal. It's an explosion of hope into his doomed existence right there. Um, suddenly, this guy has hope. He knows he's about to die. He knows he's going to stand in front of God. 
and he knows the shame that he is about to feel. All of his rottenness, all of his filthiness, all of his words and deeds and actions, all of those are about to come right up close up in front of God. Now, this is not kind of failing an exam while others pass it kind of embarrassment. Um, it's not even wearing a terrible sailor suit <laughs> um, type of humiliation. Um, it is way, way past that. This is catastrophic guilt and shame that's going to mean this man is going to be excluded from God's goodness for all eternity. You see, this guilty man knows his guilt. But as he looks at Jesus, who is perfect inside and out, and as he sees Jesus' clothes being divided up below him, this man realizes that God is offering him a set of clothes that are going to keep him right for eternity. A set of clothes that are appropriate for God's presence. A set of clothes that are going to be good for heaven. You see, this is why Jesus lived. He is the God of love. And he offers stained and guilty failures like the man on the cross and like all the people around the cross. And like us sitting here tonight, he offers us his goodness. Other parts of the Bible talk about Jesus as being like the perfect, innocent lamb of God who offers his perfection and his innocence to anyone who would ask for it. So Jesus lived so that lost people, failed people, stained people, could be forgiven and cleaned up forever. And this criminal who is dying on the cross, he really gets it. And so what does he say to Jesus? He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's got nothing to offer Jesus except this cry for mercy. And he's not disappointed because Jesus answers him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And suddenly this man's ready. Jesus has passed the exam for him. Jesus' good clothes mean that this guy is ready for paradise. So are you? Are you ready? Just as we finish, can you imagine being invited to the coronation of the new king? Now, whether you're a royalist or not, it would still be a pretty cool invitation to get, wouldn't it? Um, you'd meet some amazing people. You'd be in the presence of the king, and I bet you the food would be amazing. It would be a wonderful thing to be invited to. So even if you're not a royalist, I bet you you would sacrifice your convictions and you would go anyway. But let's say you go, um, and you get to the gate, and the soldier's standing there, and he just he can't let you in. And he can't let you in because you're not dressed appropriately. You're wearing old scabby trainers when you should be wearing nice black shoes. You're wearing an old jumper and you should be wearing a nice dinner jacket. Devastated, left out, everybody else is in and you're not getting in. Now the, the guard's kind hearted and so he says to you, well look, the king himself has left some clothes back here for anybody who's turned up unprepared. I can, I can give you the king's jacket I can give you the king's shoes. You can take them if you want. Here they are. Now, would you at that point be too offended to accept the clothes on offer? No, I don't need that. I don't need your charity. I'm all right. Would you be too apathetic? Would you think, oh, I'm not actually that bothered. I've come all this way, but I'm not actually that bothered. No, I'm all right. Well, of course you wouldn't be. Of course you wouldn't be too offended to accept the king's clothes. Of course you wouldn't be too apathetic to accept the king's clothes. Well, that's what's on offer <laughs> to every one of us here tonight. That's why this event matters so much. You're being offered something so much more vital um, than just the king of this world's clothes. Jesus has lived to offer you clothing that makes you fit for heaven. And we would ask you to just accept it. <laughs> we would ask you to accept what Jesus is offering you. Um, no matter what your pride says, no matter what your apathy says, we would say accept it um, and take what Jesus is offering. So um, thank you for listening. Um, at that point, we're going to pause and then um, we're going to have some food. And then um, Bev, who's sitting there, I'm going to ask Bev some questions later that are going to help us um, to grapple with this a little bit more. Um, but I'll leave it there for the time being, Liam, wherever you are. Um, is that okay if we leave it at that point? Okay, thanks very much. That's great. Cheers.